Tonight is Justin Logan, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, an expert on U.S. grand strategy, international relations theory, and American foreign policy, here to tell us about why uh, so many U.S. attempts to share defense burdens with our allies rather than defending our allies on their behalf have failed. Justin, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, John, and thanks to the Society um, for having me give this talk. Um, if I can start, and I can't see you, so for all I know, many of you people know more about this than I do, so I'm, I'm at great risk here. Um, but I will give a sort of a, a jokey background about this. Um, so when John approached me about doing an event, I was very happy to do it. And um, I used this as a forcing device to come up with a PowerPoint presentation for a paper that I was already writing. So lesson one is always use something uh, uh, in more than one occasion. So this forced me to draft a PowerPoint presentation. Now, the downside of this, of course, is that uh, the PowerPoint presentation hasn't yet been used. So there are going to be some foibles here. Um, there are going to be some uh, 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 hiccups, uh, I think. But um, yeah, the, the basic question of the paper, and I'll just go ahead and see if my technological skills are better than I fear they are. Um, the puzzle is U.S. leaders have complained for more than 60 years about defense burden sharing, so why have they failed to produce more of it? Um, and as a failed political scientist, I'm not really testing like discrete hypotheses against one another. I have several hypotheses that are sort of swirling around out there and are not mutually exclusive. And what I want to do um, is show them to you, first of all. Right. So the first hypothesis is simply that allies have lower threat perceptions than the United States does, right? The United States sees the world as somewhat more scary than its allies do. do. Um, and so therefore it's rational that uh, allies are, are, are spending less as a percentage of GDP um, on their defense. The second hypothesis is that the very strength of the US commitment makes shirking on the part of US allies rational. Um, and this is a story with a long uh, uh, history behind it. Some of you, I'm sure, uh, already know it. And then the third hypothesis is a little bit more cynical, um, that U.S. leaders prioritize control of their allies over an equitable distribution of the burdens of defending them, right? So in this view, um, there's a sort of uh, trade-off between um, equitable burden sharing and control over our allies' security policy, and that when pressed, U.S. elites have chosen control over equity and burden sharing, right? So the structure of the talk, I want to sort of sketch out and prove to you that this has been an enduring uh, frustration for U.S. policymakers for more than 60 years. I want to examine, and I'm using this in a blithe kind of way, um, the failure of U.S. burden sharing efforts in light of these different theories. And so the other dirty little secret of this talk is that we, for this paper, have uh, are in the process of finishing um, from 1949 to the present our own uh, uh, database looking at US and all of our allies, including the Rio Treaty, which is a sort of quirky thing, um, defense expenditures and GDP for every year, 1949 to the present. And this takes a lot of judgment calls and scrubbing double I double S data. And I don't have that data tonight. So you're gonna have to take my word for it, um, that the US has failed to produce burden sharing um, in a broad sense among its allies. And I'll be very happy to share the paper and the finalized data, but this was like, sometimes you bite off a project and it's more than you think it is. Um, getting into the weeds of uh, purchasing power parity versus market exchange rates, especially over such a broad period of time, methodological changes in terms of how uh, defense budget versus defense expenditures are calculated, et cetera, et cetera. But hopefully, and maybe you can all fillet me in the in the question and answer period, um, we can accept arguendo, right, that, that, that we failed to produce meaningful burden sharing over time. And then finally, to look to begin to look at this question, which I think we should care about, uh, whether it's possible for the United States to share burdens more equitably. And we need to leave open the possibility that it's simply not. So to begin, um, this is an old story, right? Um, so we have, I don't know if I can minimize my screen here, to do, do. Um, 
Eisenhower saying there's no reason that the Europeans can't take on these burdens. Forces were put there on a stopgap emergency basis. The Europeans now attempt to consider this deployment as permanent and definite commitment. Eisenhower thinks the Europeans are close to making a sucker out of Uncle Sam. So there's the title for your paper. Um, so long as they could prove a need for emergency help, that was one thing, but the time has passed. This is 1959. So this has been floating around out there for an awful long time. Um, and even relatively hawkish European uh, uh, U.S. politicians about Europe express similar frustrations, right? We cannot continue to pay for the military protection of Europe while the NATO states are not paying their fair share and living off the fat of the land. We've been very generous to Europe, and it is now time for us to look after ourselves, uh, knowing full well the Europeans will not do anything for us simply because we've in the past helped them. Noted Europe hawk, uh, President John F. Kennedy. I should have done my Kennedy accent there, sorry. Um, so this goes on and on and on, and I could give a 45 minute talk that would make your eyeballs bleed um, of US politicians and elites um, going on and on complaining about um, allied defense exertions. Um, but it goes up through the present, right? So uh, Bob Gates gives not one, but two speeches at the end of his tenure as Secretary of Defense, um, lamenting the chronic starvation of European defense budgets, the very real possibility of collective military irrelevance, the prospect of a dwindling appetite and patience on the part of U.S. taxpayers to continue subsidizing this thing. Um, so this is not a new problem by any stretch of the imagination. And then, of course, the coup de grace, Europe treats us worse than China. Uh, I don't even say they're wrong, but it's unfair to us. We pay for close to 100 percent of NATO. You probably can't even tell who this is without the uh, without the little tagline there. Um, so, of course, everything that happened uh, under the presidency of Donald Trump was, number one, caused by Donald Trump and number two, good. Um, and then adding insult to injury, there is the now infamous elbowing aside uh, of the leader of Montenegro at the NATO summit. So this sort of stylistic boorishness uh, really chapped uh, the European skin. Um, so this has gone on and on and on for more than 60 years, right? And you might say, well, what about Asia, right? We have allies in Asia, um, and that's a very fair uh, question. I think for a variety of reasons having to do with the structure of the alliances, a broad multilateral alliance system in Europe and what Victor Cha calls a power play system of interlinking bilateral alliances, the hub and spokes so-called system of alliances in Asia. Um, but even here, um, you have American political elites saying in relation to its size and economic wealth, Japan makes a low contribution to defense by any measure. Its defense contributions and outputs are inadequate given its tremendous economic strength. There's no doubt that Japan can and should do more. And this in turn was the House uh, Armed Services Committee burden sharing report inopportunely timed for August 1988. An awful lot went on in the next year. and Defense burden sharing sort of fell by the wayside as the sort of tectonic plates of international politics were shifting in important ways at that time. Um, but I hope that I've established that there's, you know, a longstanding thing. And when I get the data all polished up and beautiful, uh, I'll be happy to share it with you. But again, maybe we will have a good argument about whether um, we've been able to produce burden sharing. Um, so the first hypothesis here is just that our allies don't see the world as as threatening as we do. Far from being irresponsible international actors, our allies are acting quite rationally in a world that's virtually absent of serious threat, at least compared to all those that have come before. And this is Chris Fetweiss of Tulane in an article in 2011 in Comparative Strategy, basically saying our allies are right, we're wrong, the world isn't that threatening, end of story. Um, the second hypothesis, which with, with which I think probably most people uh, on the call may be familiar, is the idea that in these sorts of alliances, particularly um, the multilateral alliance system in vis-a-vis -vis NATO, um, shirking is rational. So in an alliance or other international organization composed of nations acting in their national interests, there will be a general tendency 
for the larger nations to bear disproportionately large shares and for the smaller nations to make little or no contribution to the common cause. And this, of course, is Mansur Olson and Richard Zeckhauser in 1966. So explanations for this longstanding problem are also longstanding um, in the review of economics and statistics. And I think the Olson and Zeckhauser argument spawned an entire literature. So you have John O'Neill in the 1990s pushing this thesis, testing it. You have people picking apart the so-called public goods rationale and arguing that nuclear deterrence, for example, um, is reasonably neat in terms of being uh, construed as a public good, but there are all sorts of other defense expenditures that really aren't public goods that are only that are not fungible across the alliance. Um, but it spawned, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles. So if I can give you another piece of Dutch uncle advice, um, when you get sucked into the alliance literature, as I did, sometimes you come up for air like a year later and say, I've only scraped the surface here um, to mix metaphors. So um, it really is a, 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 an enormous sort of soul sucking literature uh, to be in. And so the third, somewhat more cynical, but I think still um, worth examining hypothesis is this idea that the United States conceives of alliance control and alliance burden sharing as in tension with one another, and it tends to prefer control, right? So since 1945, the United States has always aspired to hegemony in this context is being talked about as Europe. The Soviet Union's demise simply removed the one, edipant, the one impediment to the realization of America's hegemonic ambitions. So this is Chris Lane um, in Peace of Illusions. But you could also, I think, if you want to uh, make this a sort of bipartisan or, or trans ideological thing, there's a lot of overlap here with an argument from, say, Robert Kagan, right? The Europeans are from Mars, or Euro Americans are from Mars, Europeans are from Venus, right? This is just what we do. We do the bombs and the killing, and they do the trams and social spending and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's like a lot of weight behind all three of these arguments, probably the second and third more than the first. Um, so as I'm sort of concluding this paper, concluding uh, my summation of you know why we failed to produce um, meaningful burden sharing among our allies, I wanna offer a set of provocations that all of which relate in some form or another to at least one of the hypotheses that I've suggested, right? So I think that US leaders regularly do things that discourage allied exertion rather than encourage it, right? So Madeleine Albright in the late 1990s when common foreign and security policy in Europe was growing into a thing, maybe, kind of, sort of, um, gave this speech at Saint-Malo in which she said that the United States would look askance at any European security efforts that um, violated what she called the three Ds, right? So anything that, and I, I always get these three Ds confused. So if I'm looking over to the side at my paper that I have my little note of what each, three D, each of the three Ds is, anything that diminishes NATO's centrality, anything that discriminates against NATO or anything that duplicates an existing NATO function, um, would be looked askance at by the United States. And obviously, there are a lot of things, if you wanted to stand up a meaningful um, strategic autonomy for Europe, to coin a phrase, there's going to be a lot of discrimination and duplication and diminution um, of NATO. So the Europeans, you know, which this is already a fraught proposition in general, right? There's already a lot of obstacles, especially in the 1990s, maybe less so today, and I'll get to that, um, between European states meaningfully cooperating to have something that looks like a powerful national military. Um, but Albright's speech really tamp down um, those, those sort of embryonic aspirations in Europe. Um, in 2003, then ambassador to NATO, Nicholas Burns, was dispatched at another uh, European meeting to say that European security cooperation apart from NATO posed, quote, 
the greatest threat to the transatlantic relationship, not the greatest threat to NATO, not the greatest threat to its role in Europe, but the greatest threat to the transatlantic relationship, which for understandable reasons, the Europeans value strongly. Um, so we really have a hit. We have a history, right? The Chris Lane story has something to be said for it. Um, the United States hasn't historically looked uh, uh, favorably on a lot of even again, embryonic efforts of our allies to sort of pool resources and stand up and do more for themselves. And I think there's a lot to be said for this idea of a trade-off between control and equity. Um, more recently, um, in a Brookings Institution speech in the mid-teens, uh, um, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton remarked that the NATO commitment on the part of the United States needs to be, quote, embedded in the DNA of US foreign policy. As you know, if something is embedded in your DNA, you're kind of stuck with it, right? I don't know what they're doing with the CRISPR these days, um, but it's very difficult to, to tweak your DNA. Um, similarly, now President Joe Biden in his foreign affairs essay when he was campaigning, and in many instances, what, since he's assumed the presidency, has talked about the US commitment to NATO as being, quote, sacred. Well, you know, I, I you know, good Catholic boy, I guess you could say for the most part, if something sacred, you take it seriously. Um, it's not something that is amenable or, or, or changeable or mutable in important ways. If you think something is sacred, um, it's not something that the Europeans should have to worry about the United States abandoning them anytime soon. Um, I think we have a tendency when our allies get freaked out about things, not to let them freak out, but rather to struggle constantly to reassure them, right? So things start to look a little crazy in the Pacific. We come up with the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which is doing lots more in the Pacific, right? One might think that the hub and spoke system of bilateral alliances was the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, but no, we'll simply lard on more of what we're already doing. There is also, of course, as we've been reading about lately, the European Deterrence Initiative. So we have a tendency not to let these uh, low level concerns faster, but rather to swoop on top of them and make an effort to smother them. Um, that I think is understandable, but also has some offsetting deleterious consequences. Um, and I think that leads to where we have made progress on burden sharing and there have, right, it's not just a straight trend line. I'm not telling you everything is always getting worse in this point of view, but in the instances where we've gotten a little more frisson of uh, effort from our partners, um, it's areas where we've cultivated the fear of abandonment. There's a good new article in Security Studies by Brian Blankenship um, that talks about that as sort of the backstop. So he basically says, it's not just the Olson and Zeckhauser story about it being rational for smaller, weaker states to shirk, but there has to be lingering in the background the fear that the larger patron might not be there. Um, and I think if you look historically, at areas where you know we've had modicum of success. Um, Japan in the 1970s and 1980s, and I will read to you um, a quote from Jenny Lin's paper on this subject, if I can figure this out, which is an open question. Um, she sort of talks about, um, you know, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, was an instance where the Soviet Union started to look more scary in the Pacific theater, and the United States was sort of not doing more and even in some cases doing less, right? So I guess you can see my PDF here in front of us, right? Um, the United States had chosen to deploy Pacific naval forces to the Indian Ocean. It had become apparent that the security of the West Pacific could no longer essentially be the sole responsibility of the United States, right? So we're telling Japanese, hey, you know, we're, we're not gonna do more. And if you look at it, um, Japan made a number of domestic political changes and indeed some defense procurement changes that where they saw a growing threat that was not being countered by the United States, they decided to do more. So I think, um, you know, we do have a history of in these areas, You and, and this goes really in contravention to all the instincts of the American foreign policy establishment, you might want to encourage some uncertainty. You might not want to reassure if you want your allies to do more. Um, 
And then the question becomes, what happens when we do reassure, but exogenous events produce fear? And I think we're doing that in Europe right now, right? Um, the U.S. is doing everything that we can to talk about our commitment to NATO, to talk about our commitment to Europe. Um, but there is this lingering fear that NATO or no NATO stuff looks kind of scary. Um, and I think we've seen uh, the German commitment to 100 billion euro um, defense fund. I mean, if you had told me three months ago that Germany would make a commitment to go to 2% of GDP and do it with a 100 billion euro commitment over four years, I would have said you were out of your mind. I mean, we were arguing about Nord Stream 2 getting canceled a month ago, and that seems like ancient history. So it may not be the case that um, letting these things fester while doing nothing is what's required, but some combination of something that looks scary and concern that existing efforts may not be adequate seems to be what produces greater burden sharing. And I think in conclusion, looking at a situation in which the United States continues to talk about prioritizing the Asia Pacific region, prioritizing the Navy, but the budgetary and attention focus in Washington are not really matching those rhetorical commitments. Um, this is something that we really need to be thinking about, right? If we're going to, if the China threat is, you know, maybe not as tall as John Mearsheimer and Bridge Colby say it is, but it's a real thing nonetheless, um, we really do start to need to think about, start to need to think about, need to start to thinking about um, what we can do to offload some of these burdens, right? And it may be that the Chris Fetwey story is right. Um, Barry Posen also wrote an article about a year ago saying Europe could defend itself today. Um, but I think if you pose a scenario in which the United States is not reassuring Europe any more than it already has been, um, you might even be getting more exertion, more cooperation out of the Europe Europeans vis-a-vis -vis Russia um, than you're already getting. So I think what I'll do is shut up now, um, stop sharing my screen, if I can figure that out, and um, engage in the discussion. So I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for doing the awful thing of reading PowerPoint slides to you. It sucks when people do that to me, but I did it to you. Um, and I look forward to the discussion. So thank you. Yeah, and everybody, you can drop your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom, or you can upvote others' questions that you wanted to see. Um, one, one thing that kind of popped into my head is, as you were doing your presentation uh, is, is thinking about how, you know, it, it certainly seems true that we don't do a lot to let our allies fear abandonment, uh, fear us abandoning them, uh, and that that would be a hindrance to burden sharing. At the same time, it, I feel like the script flips a bit when we talk about nuclear issues where we say, you know, extended deterrence seems to be pretty hard. We're like, it's hard to convince, you know, Estonia that we're going to take nukes in Boston and New York and, you know, the missile fields up in Wyoming and all that in order to protect like Tallinn. Uh, you know, and so basically it, it would seem like on the conventional front, maybe, or the overall picture, we don't let them fear abandonment all that much. Yeah. But on the nuclear side, a lot of people here wonder if it's even credible in the first place to say that we're going to defend these countries. What, what do you make of this? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of our allies are need factories, right? Um, particularly, and I won't name any of them uh, individually, but the ones that are completely indefensible. Um, from a military point of view, if you bracket away nuclear weapons, um, it's perfectly rational, rational for those countries to want the United States um, to wave nuclear weapons around on their behalf. Um, it's rational if you look at the discussions, uh, you know, Joe Biden was going to, to create a no first use policy um, on the part of the United States. That's dead in the water uh, at this point for reasons that are very much related to this phenomenon that you're talking about. And I think that, you know, one of the other things that, you know, not to reference Barry for the second time in this article, you know, Barry basically says Europe could defend itself today. But then he wrote a um, subsequent article saying if the United States did only strategic nuclear deterrence and only some ISR in Europe, it'd save about $70 billion a year. So even if you wanted to, to sort of walk into this and say, you guys are responsible for, um, close air support for air defense, 
for infantry, for armor, for all of these things, and simply allowed those uh, U.S. ground forces to tread out over time. I mean, 70 billion bucks a year is not nothing. You know, I mean, even in this era of, you know, dropping a trillion here, a trillion there, um, 70 billion dollars a year every year, people complain about infrastructure. I don't know how, you know, accurate all of those things are. But 70 billion bucks a year is a decent amount of infrastructure. They complain about education. They complain about healthcare. 70 billion, 70 billion. So I think, you know, we have a lot of upside to looking at ways of doing this that is not just ripping the Band-Aid off. And I do think that, yes, it's very, look, some of the expansion of NATO um, was ill-advised. Um, some people said it was ill-advised at the time um, that countries were indefensible um, and, and that that was a good reason not to commit to defend them. I mean, if you look at the Baltic states, the Baltic states were admitted to NATO in 2004. There was no defense plan for defending them until 2010. And that's because the Balts complained after the Georgia war, um, hey, there's no plan for our defense. Maybe we should come up with one. And even any plan that you draw up in 2010 is a joke, right? <laughs> Maybe not now that we're seeing the uh, the vaunted Russian military on maneuver in Ukraine. Um, but it is it is like NATO in particular has this Janus face as both um, a friendly club of people who dress better than us that we talk about democracy with on the one hand, and also a serious military alliance that's about fighting Russia. And when we talk about defending the indefensible, it's the friendly, well-dressed democracy club. And when we talk about big and bad Russia, then it becomes the serious military alliance. It would be good to have those two identities fused together, um, especially when you're looking at taking on additional commitments so that you can scrutinize the feasibility of the commitments in the first place. Yeah, kind of another question that, that jumped to mind is, you know, the the fear that I think a lot of people would have, especially if we're talking about using the prospect of abandonment to induce greater uh, self-protection effort uh, on the part of these allies, uh, is that they have they have another choice. You know, they they can respond to aggressors by balancing against them, which is what we want them to do. On the other hand, they can respond to aggressors by kind of ignoring them, buck passing, you know, saying, all right, yeah, Ukraine, you know, or Estonia is getting invaded today. I'm not getting invaded, you know, so I'm like Spain or something. This is way far away from me. Why should I care? And then at some point, you know, significant chunks of Europe start getting rolled up. Or they say, wow, you know, the, the going's really good. Uh, you know, maybe I'm Hungary and I, I'd like a piece of Romania and maybe a little bit of Ukraine too that I think ought to be mine. Uh, I'm going to, if the Russians are going after the Ukrainians, I'm going to help out. I'm going to bandwagon with them. Uh, how should we think about those kinds of, uh, of threats of like the, the threat of abandonment inducing a really bad kind of strategic autonomy that we don't want to see? Yeah, those are both good questions, right? So like the balancing bandwagoning story, um, look, I think that, and this gets in inevitably to, you know, Ukraine discussions, right? I think that a Europe without the American pacifier, as Joseph Joffe calls it, um, is going to leave some states worse off, right? They're going to be more vulnerable to bullying by Russia, or as you point out, by potentially their neighbors, than they are with Article 5, right? Um, so if I were in Tallinn or Riga or wherever, I would think I'm crazy. I would think that somebody should shut Justin Logan down um, and not have him talk again. Um, so I do think that it is, it is true that um, states outside, if you will, the industrial heartland, the industrial centers of Europe, um, would be worse off. Do I worry terribly about a Hungary-Romania war? Um, probably not um, for a variety of reasons, but I do think it's important for people who take the position that I take to point out um, that the smaller, weaker, less defensible states in Europe would see their strategic environment shift somewhat dramatically. Um, so I don't worry about, you know, you sort of floated this idea of, you know, Russian revanchism. And Ben Friedman and I wrote a piece earlier this month, um, 
you know, the, the war in Ukraine, as tragic and destructive and, you know, uh, I don't have enough modifiers to use here, but awful as it is, um, the, the, if you want to look for an upside, it's that we have seen the Russian military um, with a terrible, astoundingly bad concept of operations implemented astoundingly badly. Um, this, I mean, is just, you know, and I say this as an American with, you know, my share of pathetic military performances under my own country's belt. Um, this is just disgraceful. Um, it's weird because you get like, there are two sorts of people on Twitter, right? The people who think that, um, you know, we sort of have to hitch our cart to Zelensky's horse and do whatever he wants because he's going to, you know, stomp the Russians into the ground. And then there are the people who seem to think that the Russians are actually doing really well. Um, and I, and I, I find it hard to be buffeted by these two varying um, um, tribes, but the Russian military has not done well, right? I mean, this is like, you know, the United States invading Mexico and finding itself in the first 72 hours of the war, you know, overrunning its supply a lot. I mean, this is, just, it's, it's amateur hour over there. Um, so I even, you know, like my marginal case was always Poland, right? Like, I'm like ah, you know, I think I'm right, but what... Stretching these supply lines out another three or four or 500 or 600 miles to get into Poland makes the Russians sitting ducks. So I think you're looking at 20, 30, 40 years of everything going perfect for Russia to rebuild its military into something that can meaningfully threaten the, the sort of the, the, the parts of Europe that we used to go to war over. Um, so, yes, I, I want to grant very candidly that there would be, it, it would not be all flowers and roses, flowers and chocolates for everybody in Europe um, doing this. And it wouldn't even be flowers and chocolates for the Germans or the French, right? They, they're going to have to overcome a lot of um, uh, mm -hmm. obstacles, institutional obstacles, bureaucratic obstacles um, to deeper and further cooperation. It's something that I think they're doing, but it's, and, and they're going to have to spend more money, right? The great conceit of American alliances over the past 60 years has been a transfer payment from American taxpayers to French and German and British and Polish and Italian taxpayers to say, we'll foot the bill for a goodly chunk of your defense, right? So the Fetweiss argument says, no, no, it's just dead weight loss, right? We're just buying defense equipment that's entirely unnecessary. And I'll leave it to people to you know, think that's right or think it's wrong. But if you, you posit, for example, that the overall amount of defense exertion in Europe combined with the US and European NATO is about right, a lot of that is US taxpayer money, right? And German and French and Italian and Spanish taxpayers are gonna have to pony up those tens of billions of dollars a year. And, you know, I, I love European junkets as much as the next guy. Um, but sorry, um, you know, these are the prices of, uh, you know, international politics. Yeah, and so I, th I think that's a natural transfer to another question I had, which is about, you know, this in particular, this big German initiative to kind of uh, gear up to have a, a greater level of capability. And there are a lot of questions about how much this will this will stick, you know, because they're uh they've they've told us before that they're going to rearm uh and they didn't uh when they said in 2014 or, or 2000 i think it was 2014 that the big two percent commitments came out and then they basically said yeah we'll hit that someday uh and not today uh and and then also uh there are all these internal obstacles uh to actually rearming and uh there are plenty of ways to badly invest your defense budget. You know, a lot of a lot of European states will plow their money into personnel, into retirement funds, and then count that as uh, as a defense expenditure. Or they can do things like say, you know what, uh, we make a really good tank, uh, even though it's not actually the best tank, but it's pol from a political economy standpoint, it's the tank that keeps that factory running in that town. And so we end up building a military that doesn't make a lot of sense as a military, but makes a lot of sense as a jobs and industrial policy. Uh, you know, should we be, should we, do we expect that the Europeans uh, 
are actually going to build a coherent defense uh, in response to uh, to this particular shock, the Ukraine shock, or towards a uh, you know a, a policy in which the U.S. threatens uh, abandonment. So I think we're not going to get enough out of it, but 100 billion euros is nothing to sniff at. Um, and I think you know it's been just. It shouldn't be amazing at this point, but it is kind of amazing um, that, you know, the, the people that I see just really sort of waving this off as just a, a frivolity are like British and Polish, right? They're the people who like NATO, right? They're, and this is the same thing with Macron, right? Like everybody that hates strategic autonomy is very happy with the U.S. commitment for understandable reasons, right? The U.K. sort of fancies itself as a junior United States. The Poles and the other East Europeans don't really think that the French and the Germans have a lot of stomach for standing up to the Russians and their part of the world. Um, so this is very understandable. Um, but I think, you know, we're not going to get enough out of it because we're simultaneously doing all of this reassurance, right? Um, the, the upside, and let me briefly make the case for this, right? As I mentioned before, you know, we were arguing about whether the Germans would have the uh, 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 intestinal fortitude to shut down Nord Stream 2. They've gone way, way, way further than that. Um, so I think that's a good news story. Um, but I, and I think let me just add that um, I'll add the, the public opinion piece. Right. So when this was announced, it was very interesting to see what the German public thought. 78% of the German public supported the move. Um, another poll a couple of weeks later said something like 65%. That's amazing, right? Like, so that is a sea change, right? Like, so even if 25 billion euro for, per year for four years can be wasted on pensions and hokey defense industrial based stuff in Germany, which it will, um, it's, it's still even the sort of the, the bleed over from this expenditure um, is going to have some effect. And I will just sort of tack on to this one piece that I think is important vis-a-vis -vis the United States. One of the reasons we don't like European in particular defense exertions is because Europeans have the gall to want to spend their defense euros on European kit on a European defense industrial base. And that's what we do. That's not fair. They're supposed to buy our stuff. And I think we really need to come to grips with the fact that the politics of defense in Europe are gonna look pretty similar to the politics of defense in the United States. Not every US defense dollar is allocated perfectly efficiently to the highest and best use. And a, too many U.S. defense dollars are allocated toward the U.S. defense industrial base, right? I get my colleagues will do a whole riff about the Jones Act and how we could be buying, you know, Finnish boats, et cetera, et cetera. So the pathologies of defense spending that exist in the United States are going to exist in allies that do more. They're not just going to flood billions of euros into only U.S. defense equipment. And I think that we need to come to grips with the fact and even encourage the development of as effective, as efficient of, in this case, a European defense industrial base is, can possibly be produced. Um, because if you think about it, if you're trying to prop up European defense spending, and if you get the same, what I would argue, are pathological politics of defense spending that obtain in the United States, that's going to create upward pressure on European defense spending, right? Because you're creating jobs. And you know all the reasons that it's difficult to do another BRAC in the United States, um, it's gonna be difficult to stop production lines in Europe. So I think that that is um, a, a thing that has been tricky throughout history, but something that we should look with at least a medium term view, if I don't sound unduly woolly headed about it, um, that this would be a good thing for propping up European expenditures over the medium and indeed the long term. So we've got a question uh, from one of our attendees. Are partnerships like AUKUS a, uh, a good template or, a, or perhaps a better template uh, for burden sharing? Yeah, so we had the French ambassador at Cato in December, so I don't want to talk about AUKUS too much for fear of uh, invoking his wrath. Um, but let me talk a little bit about the dynamics of the sort of bilateral versus multilateral. And obviously, AUKUS is, you know, almost bilateral and almost multilateral. It's, I guess it's multilateral, technically. Um, 
the one of the interesting things is that historically the United States, the smaller the number of partners in an alliance or partnership or defense relationship, um, the United States has tended to have even more control, right? So if you look at Japan, um, if you look at the Korea um, defense treaty, um, these are places where we have an awful lot of, and, and it was sort of, you know, Victor Cha is sort of um, um, tries to thread this needle. It was designed for control. Um, and so I think the, the, if you use that framework um, in the context of evaluating relatively large alliances versus small bilateral or you know three party four party alliances, um, and I don't know whether this is particularly a dynamic of the alliance configuration itself or the way the United States behaves in those alliance configurations. Um, so it may just be that you know it happens to be the case. So I worry about um, these instances where you know we have a system of bilateral alliances. I don't like being the hub, right? Like if all the spokes have to look inward to the hub, that's the nature of hubs and spokes. Um, and I think that you know what we should be looking to do is to cultivate. Um, some of the things that we've seen in Asia, where you have, for example, India talking more to Australia without the United States, right? These are the sorts of things that we should be doing. And it's hard to cultivate things that you're not involved in. Um, so I think it's delicate um, to do that. But my preference would be to try as best as we can to encourage these countries to get together. There's a real comedy of interests among countries like all the countries surrounding China, right? If you look at the Chinese um, military problems, they range from the line of actual control with India, where China claims two Indian provinces as part of its own territory, um, down through the Indian Ocean, up the Philippine Sea. I mean, just like every single <laughs> border or ocean or slock that they have, somebody's beefing with them. Um, and I would like to see those states that are beefing with China at every single juncture talking more to each other without the United States directing things or being the hub of these things. So um, that's a sort of tangential from the question. But I think with, with these smaller relationships, particularly bilateral ones, historically, we have, for understandable reasons, tended to demand an outsized amount of control. Um, and I worry about that tendency, that sort of muscle memory in the American diplomatic establishment. Yeah, it would, it would seem like uh, Asia is particularly... Uh... Uh, you know, a strong case of that because you look at Korea and Japan, South Korea and Japan, and, you know, they have a lot of common interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. I mean, especially I think this new administration in Korea is going to be very uh, – have a more uh, Japanese view of, uh, of North Korea. Uh, and yet they've got a lot of historical baggage that uh, they have not put aside. And you could kind of contrast that with a place, a region where there is a lot of historical baggage, but also a lot of uh, fear of abandonment, namely the Middle East, where, you know, just uh, this this week, the Israelis uh, were sitting down with uh, four, I believe, other uh, four Arab countries uh, and the United States. Um you know, it, it, at the same time, though, that that alliance, I, I guess this is kind of where my question comes in, that particular alignment is something that the United States shepherded, even though there is also a big fear of abandonment on the part of, say, the Gulf states vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. What, what do you make of all that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what you're looking at, you know, to start with the Japan, South Korea example, we're always arguing about realism versus liberalism. This is the great looming battle of the titans between realism and constructivism, right? This is the these sort of uh, contingent historical relationships tested against very real pressing old fashioned realist get the map out type considerations. Um, and I think it has been a source of immense frustration for those of us in the realist camp um, that these historic, you know, to, to my mind, you know, um, and I'm, you know, apologize to any Japanese or Koreans that are on the call, but like, get over it. 
right? I mean, the, the, the stakes that are involved between Japan and Korea in material terms are not substantial, right? These are not, it's not as though, you know, the industry, you know, it's not Alsace and Lorraine. Um, it's not, you know, there's not a lot of there there. There's a lot, I mean, we have a lot of, um, you know, for a relatively young country, a lot of historical grievances of our own. Um, but you would think that if, you know, Mexico or Canada looked like China um, and we had fraught relations with the other of the two parties, we'd figure out a way to put them aside, I hope. Um, maybe the Scots-Irish, I'm part Scots-Irish, so I could say that they'd want to keep fighting. Um, but you got to get over this stuff. And I think that, you know, the South Koreans and the Japanese will be very content um, to keep these sort of political lightning rods electrified. And I think that we should be encouraging them not to do so. Um, in terms of the, the sort of the Abraham Accords, the great detente between, um, you know, a lot of the Gulf Arab states and Israel, right? The, the, the great um, um, irony here, if you look at commentary on the Middle East um, over the last 20 years. This is a realist story, right? <laughs> it's a story about everybody being freaked out by Iran um, and countries that really kind of hate each other, right? Um, it's, it's some uh, 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 primordial level. Um, putting that aside, and working together. And, you know, realism is not like a happy, sunny story, right? It doesn't tie everything up with a neat bow and, and, and put things to bed. But if countries that really in a kind of primordial sense don't like each other can put that aside and can cooperate against what they perceive to be security threats, it's not a happy story, but it's, it's international politics goes a good story. Um, and I think that that is something that, yeah, I mean, they, you know, if they see their region is more threatening than we see it, um, good. Then, you know, you guys can can put your historical grievances aside and sit down and talk. Um, and I think, you know, again, I, I hate to say that something is fraught with all sorts of illiberal grossness as, you know, the politics, the international politics of the Middle East is a happy story. But as international politics goes, it's kind of a happy story. Yes, yeah, so we've got a question from uh, Cole Dobney who asks, if the Europeans do start working toward increased defense expenditures and kind of free up U.S. resources in Europe, would the United States be best to refocus on other areas of the world, say the Western Hemisphere, Africa, East Asia, or do you think a, uh, a more muted foreign policy would serve us better? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I try to be as ecumenical in these talks as possible, right? So if the left wingers want to pour it into healthcare and the right wingers want to pour it into tax cuts and the China hawks want to pour it into the Navy, you know, once we get to the point that we're arguing about that, I'll have chalked a small win. Um, I So for myself to put, you know, to, to divide the audience against me, um, I, I think that the focus, the relative focus on the Navy for the United States is appropriate and good and not happening. Um, if you look at the defense budget that was just announced, it's as though it's, it's the usual story. If everything is a priority, nothing is a priority, right? The United States is a big giant island, uh, or in the worst case, um, it is a continental power with weak, friendly neighbors to the north and south and fish to the east and west, as Jean-Jules Jusserand said. Um, in the early 20th century, the French ambassador to the United States. So um, we should have a big Navy and a tiny army. Um, we don't have a tiny army. The army that we have buys lots of really expensive stuff that it's never going to use. Um, it buys lots of stuff that would be very useful if we were going to invade Iraq again. Um, I certainly hope we don't invade Iraq again. Um, so I think that with, with the risk of sounding equivocal and squishy, um, I probably think that cutting the defense budget would be good. And I think that what's left in the defense budget should be reoriented toward um, an ocean going Navy, toward um, um, undersea capabilities. I could go on and on about you know what in the Navy, but I think we should have a much smaller army, a much bigger Navy, um, and do some changes inside the Air Force. But yeah, I think the defense budget is too big. 
Um, I think that what is in the defense budget should be fundamentally reoriented toward the United States geopolitical position, which is that we've more or less got the Western Hemisphere locked down in military terms, um, and we should worry a non-trivial amount about uh, the waterways, the commons, if you want to use that rhetoric. Um, but yeah, so I would take some of the some of the winnings and pour them into the Navy and some of the winnings and, you know, I don't know, put a few bucks in everybody's pocket. Another uh, question I think kind of comes up since you're mentioning uh, the Navy and implicitly the uh, the Pacific. Uh, one of the big burden sharing questions floating around today is is around Taiwan, uh, and, and it in some ways it's a question of them spending enough, and some of it is a question of them buying the right stuff. Uh, you know that they're buying a lot of high end systems like F-16s and M1 tanks. Uh, for a country that has a lot of mountains, cities, and and uh, wetland kind of rice paddies, uh, you know the uh, there's a question of whether the United States should or can induce uh, a more anti-access territorial defense style of military. Uh, you know, and folks like Bridge Colby, you mentioned earlier, have kind of said, "Hey, like we should we should be really twisting their arm." on this and, you know, kind of using a lot of leverage to push them in that direction. Do you think that that's kind of something that that we're capable of doing, that we should be doing, et cetera? I mean, we've met the enemy and he's us um, on a lot of levels, right? We made them buy tanks. They didn't want tanks. We told them they had to prop up the production line. Um, and they just like, the, I mean, it's, 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 strategic malpractice, right? If they're going to spend two and a half percent of their GDP on defense, they shouldn't buy a single tank. They should have zero tanks. The tanks are not going to be there. By the time a tank becomes useful to Taiwan, it's over. They're screwed. There's nothing they can do. Um, and so as much as I would like to wag my finger at the Taiwanese and say, this is your fault. You guys are acting like children here. It's our fault. We told them to do it and they dutifully did it. Um, they have their own pathologies. If you left them to their own devices, they wouldn't do the right things either. Um, but I think uh, the idea that Taiwan, looking at the strategic situation it finds itself in, is spending two and a half of its GDP on defense is insane. It's completely insane. Um, and I think that we have in some ways a situation in which strategic ambiguity is producing literally the inverse of what you would want. What you would want is the Taiwanese thinking we won't defend them and the Chinese thinking that we will. And what we're getting is a situation in which the Taiwanese appear by their behavior to think that we're definitely going to defend them. And the Chinese appearing by their behavior, by the capabilities that they're developing to think that if they make it nasty enough for us, we won't defend them. Um, and that's bad, right? Like we, <laughs> what you want is for the Chinese to think we'll definitely defend them and for the Taiwanese to worry. And that's not what we have at all. So I think there needs to be, look, this stuff is boring, right? Like nobody wants to read an op-ed about, you know, Taiwan's hokey defense procurement pathologies or the extent to which we're on the hook for those hokey defense procurement pathologies. Um, but we kind of need to grow up, right? Like if the stakes in Taiwan are what Bridge Colby says they are, or are what, I don't know, it, one quarter of Bridge Colby would say they were then they're pretty big and they're pretty serious and things are getting pretty nasty over there. We should probably talk about it more. But if every shiny object that comes along in a United States where one quarter of the countries on the globe have a formal alliance commitment from the United States, when every shiny object that comes along there grabs our attention and sucks the oxygen out of Washington. I mean, this is, you know, we had this great discussion in Afghanistan, right? And, and this was a, you know, I mean, the amount of stupid nonsense that came out of Washington about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, even for a jaded old guy like me, was astounding. Right. So the the I, I forget whether the border between Afghanistan and China is like 50 or 60 kilometers. It's it's tiny. It's like it's like the little tail that comes off uh, the east of Afghanistan. This was a coup for China because it, they could use that border to do dot, dot, dot something. Um, I mean, we have too many commitments, that it's not just the amount of money that they suck out of this country. It's not just the amount of um, warring that they produce, but the attention, 
The United States has a complete inability to focus strategically. It's evinced in this defense budget. It's been evinced in everything that we've done since the vaunted pivot to Asia in 2011. We announced a pivot to Asia 11 years ago, and it has not happened because every flashy streetcar that comes by, we jump onto, um, whether it's counterinsurgency or surges or God knows what, um, you know, the, the return of history to Europe, fill in the blank. There's always going to be something. The world is not going to stop. International politics is not going to stop. So if the stakes of the U.S.-China relationship are as high, even as I think they are, then we're going to have to not do some stuff. And we're going to have to not pay attention to some stuff. And we're going to have to tell other countries, this is your job, not ours. And I see very little indication that the Biden administration, which has talked this way, the Trump administration, which talked this way, the Obama administration, which talked this way. And even if you want to go back to Bush administration, which in 2000 was talking about um, um, focusing, you know, superpowers don't do windows. I mean, they were doing this whole business about we're not going to do nation building. We had the EP3 incident, you know, the defense budget, uh, political incentives were all lined up. And then that all went by the wayside. If we cannot focus, the world is going to pass us by. And I see very little indication that we can focus. Yeah, I will say, you know, I've, I mean, I've been in Washington for about a, a decade at this point. And I've been blown away uh, how much we are talking about prioritization now. And it's it's still very little. But the fact that we're talking about it all, you know, the fact that the NDS fact sheet the other day seemed to imply that we have more that that China is more of a priority than Russia. I was just so impressed by that, and that and I and I realize like when I think about it, that's a very low bar, uh, you know, for any kind of uh, any kind of prioritization uh, to be to be happening. Um, one last question, since we're about at time. Uh, one of the other things that's been uh, in the headlines a bit lately with the situation in Ukraine uh, is Scandinavia, that the Swedes and Finns uh, might be reconsidering uh, their kind of semi-neutral status and looking to potentially enter NATO. And this is an interesting question from a burden sharing standpoint, because usually they're seen as comparatively capable, especially the Finns, uh, you know, compared to say a state like Germany. Uh, and, and in theory, you'd be taking on less of a immediate burden sharing problem, but at the same time, they'd be getting this great defense partner uh, that could carry a lot of burden for them. Do, do you agree with that assessment? But also, do you think that uh, we might see a uh, a NATO that includes Finland and Sweden, that those, the, those two states might start reducing their defense uh, spending if they get that defense guarantee? Yeah, I mean, I hate making predictions, but I find myself continuing to do it. If I had to bet, I would say that Finland and Sweden are not going to join NATO, right? Like, I think that it's very understandable and predictable from a sort of high church realist point of view that they would start talking about this now. Um, I think the basic underlying realities that have caused them not to join NATO heretofore probably will hold, probably will continue to obtain. Um, I do think that um, the uh, look, right, like the Finns know how to fight Russia. Can I just say that? I mean, <laughs> they've, they've done it before, right? Um, they, you know, they lost, but they put up a good, you know, uh, 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 fight and like way disproportionate to what they should have been able to do. They train for one thing, right? Like um, they have an awful lot of snipers. It's really cold, you know, like <laughs> if, if the Russians remember how to do combined arms, you know, it's going to be a pain for them. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't. <sighs> Do I think do I as an American support uh, Finland and Sweden becoming formal treaty allies of the United States? No, I think the United States should be trying to create distance between itself and Europe. And look, I think if the Finns and Swedes, you know, want to come in and you know be part of a European effort, I mean, I think that's a good uh, thing for Europe. Um, but it's really not for me to say because I think that you know we should be trying to to exit the continent um, since the continent doesn't need us except as a subsidy. Um, you had, you had some tag on to that, and I forgot what it was. 
if they were to join, which it sounds like you think is not very likely, would they start reducing their defense spending? Oh, right. Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question, right? It might, I mean, they're not like enormous outsized spenders as it is, and they spend relatively well. Um, you know, they both have industry, you know, sort of industries that are at least defense adjacent or in the Swedes case, very much defense involved. Um, so I think they have incentives for, for propping up those industries. Um, I don't, you know, in the short term, I think probably not, right? Like a lot of this stuff is just inertia is a very powerful political and economic force. Um, over the longer term, yeah, I think it's possible. Um, but I don't, yeah, that's an interesting question for me that I don't have a great answer for. All right. Well, with that, that is all the time that we have. Uh, thank you so much to Justin Logan for taking the time to speak with us tonight about defense burden sharing. I've dropped uh, some links to some upcoming events in the chat once again for all of you to take a look at. But with that, thank you very much to all of you for attending. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks to talk about the situation in Korea. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody.